Why does this man drink? What is troubling this child? Why did this boy try to kill his father? These are the kinds of people which the psychiatric caseworker tries to help. Tomorrow's Careers, presented by the Johns Hopkins University and the ABC Television Network from the studios of WAAM in Baltimore. Each week, the Johns Hopkins University presents the highlights of a different career to show you the story of the men who work in it, their preparation and rewards, and an insight into the problems they solve. This week, we bring you the story of the psychiatric caseworker with our guests, Dr. Jerome Frank and Miss Regina Slaughter. Now here to introduce this week's program is your host from Johns Hopkins University, Lynn Poole. I'm sure that you'll agree with me that there is no field of science that's made greater strides in the past 50 years than the science of psychiatry. It's the science of studying and aiding the problems of the human mind. You know, for centuries, people had troubled minds. They lived unhappy lives. No one could do a thing for them. But now we know that psychiatric illness is related, often it's related to the chronic difficulties in getting along with other people, other people that are around us day by day. It's a problem of living together, of men and women and children, and there they find their greatest satisfactions and also their most baffling frustrations. But sometimes at the worst, an individual becomes a derelict. He requires complete care by others. More often, with proper assistance, the patient can be restored to social competence and a satisfactory life. Now, the combined skills of a whole team of professionally trained workers may be needed to bring this about. And this week, we have chosen to emphasize the part of one member of that team. And that member is the psychiatric caseworker. Now, the psychiatric caseworker helps the psychiatric patients and their families to resolve their mutual problems. Now, from extensive case records, Dr. Frank and Miss Slaughter have selected and will present some very illuminating examples. And our guest, Dr. Jerome Frank, is associate professor of psychiatry and psychiatrist in charge of the outpatient department of the Phipps Clinic. And Miss Regina Slaughter, our other guest, is a case supervisor in the social service department of the Johns Hopkins Hospital. And she is responsible for the social service program in the Phipps Clinic. Now, of course, names and identifying features of patients have been changed. And their roles are being played by actors. So, let's begin by asking Dr. Frank to tell you about the first case that we want to demonstrate this week. Mr. Mitchell, our first patient, has had a drinking problem. He tells me that he is not allowed to be the boss in his own home, and I think this is a big part of the trouble. This young couple live with his mother-in-law, who runs things with an iron hand. In a showdown, Mrs. Mitchell always turns to her mother instead of to him. In his exasperation, he turns to alcohol, and then his wife feels all the more justified in not relying on him. After working with Mr. Mitchell, I feel sure that he is able to assume more leadership in the home. He holds a responsible job and has held offices in community organizations. I also get the impression that in spite of everything, he and his wife are devoted to each other and their children. Mrs. Mitchell is pleased with her husband's progress and welcomed the opportunity to see the social caseworker so that she might better understand how she can be helpful to her husband. Through working with Mrs. Mitchell, the caseworker hoped to enable her to put more confidence in her husband. This will do a lot for his self-respect and will, I believe, help him to cut down on his drinking. Miss Slaughter is visiting Mrs. Mitchell now. She was surprised to find Mr. Mitchell at home when she visited Mrs. Mitchell, but he seemed to want to present his side of the story personally to the social worker. Look at her, Miss Slaughter. Just, just take a look at her. You couldn't find a kinder face, but believe me, this woman is vicious. She has really tied me up in knots. Mom is bossy, Miss Slaughter, but I don't know where I'd be without her. She has a heart as big as all outdoors. Joe just doesn't understand doesn't her. Doesn't understand her. That's always a woman's last line of defense when she's wrong. Look, I understand your mother. I know that there's nothing wrong with her intentions. I know that she's a person who's used to living for others, and when your old man died, she poured herself on us. Look, I know all that. 
But, Miss Slaughter, you've got to understand, this is a woman who rides right over you, tramples you and smothers you, trying to help you. The caseworker is careful not to set herself up as a judge in the situation. By asking skillful questions, she tried to help them see the issues more clearly. You get very angry with your mother-in-law, don't you? Just the other night at dinner, my six-year-old was misbehaving. Well, I took so much, and then I blew the whistle. I sent him to his room. Well, my mother-in-law pipes up and says, he needs the food, he has to eat. Well, I said that, this, that he should be punished, and if she didn't like it, she could get out. Well, mother's got a big, fat answer for everything. That was her cue for the martyr routine, how she'd given up her vacation to California because of my debts. I tell you, I'd like to take that halo she wears and tie it around her neck. But I never do anything. I just sit there, feeling like a flat tire. And then my wife gangs up on me and says, better let mom handle the situation. I guess you feel on the spot when your mother and husband argue. Do you tend to uh, side with your mother? Well, I guess I do. I admit mom is difficult to deal with. I guess my problem is that I've never really dealt with her. I've always taken her advice as the best possible. You see, our first child was born just before the Korean War. Joe was called into service, and Mom and I took this house together. It was a financial necessity as much as anything else. When Joe came back, Mom stayed on with us to help us along until he was earning a decent salary so we could keep up this house. He worked for about nine months when he started drinking and lost his job. I still say this is the present. Mother is dead weight now. Let's, let's move to a place where we don't need her help. Let's, let's clear the air so there won't be all this arguing. So there'll only be one boss. Miss Slaughter, I'm just not ready to do that. I keep remembering those times that I didn't know from one minute to the next whether Joe was sober or working. He'd get disgusted and move out for weeks at a time. I can't go through that again. I just can't. Look, all this has nothing to do with right now. Let's, let's lay our cards on the table. My wife is a wonderful woman, but she just never grew up. She needs her mama. She's never been able to make any decisions without her. And it's having that old bat around that causes all my drinking. I say, let's turn her out. Mr. Mitchell, do you really think that would solve the problem? No, I guess you're right. They'd probably chew up the telephone all the time. Those two are thicker than thieves. For the past three months, Miss Slaughter has been seeing Mrs. Mitchell once a week. As you can imagine, the family readjustment has not been easy for anyone, especially for Mrs. Mitchell, whose loyalties are divided. Miss Slaughter is again visiting Mrs. Mitchell. Joe's standing up to my mother all right. And honestly, I haven't opened my mouth. It's just terrible. They were actually screaming at each other at the dinner table last night. I got so nervous I couldn't eat. You won't agree with me, but it was a lot easier on me when I kept peace between them. I know. I'm sure the old way was a lot easier for you, but rather hard on Mr. Mitchell. What good does it do for everybody to be angry all the time? Joe screams at Mom. She screams at him. But let me tell you, He's still scared of her. Last night, after all the screaming, he just sat there like a whipped pup with his head hanging. Your mother seems to terrify most people. Mr. Mitchell doesn't act this way with anyone else, does he? Heavens, no. That's just what I don't understand. Everybody's always telling me what a wonderful guy he is. Sunday at the ball game, at least a dozen people came over just to speak to Joe. Often, young married couples are reluctant to give up the known and trusted emotional ties to parents, fearing to stand on their own two feet. Mrs. Mitchell evidences these fears and is angered as the social worker presses her to act independently of her mother and to allow Mr. Mitchell to be assertive. You're right. Joe's got time for everybody but his own family. He's a big shot with all his friends. Knows all the answers, gives advice. He says I'm nagging him if I try to get him to behave. Somebody's got to keep the kids in order. If Mom isn't going to, who will? He can't do it. Mr. Mitchell can't discipline the children, or it's difficult for you to let him. But Miss Slaughter, Joe is so inconsistent. They're accustomed to listening to my mother. I don't think he wants the responsibility, but he gets mad if anyone else takes over. I know, but let's, let's see what he actually does do when he disciplines the children. You mentioned this episode at the table when Buddy had to be sent upstairs the other night. What actually happened? In this somewhat stormy fashion, the Mitchells are slowly working out their problems with the aid of the caseworker. Meanwhile, Mr. Mitchell is not drinking. He has been promoted in his work, and he tells me he is happier with his wife. Though the situation is very trying at present, 
we believe that she will eventually stand by her husband. Children as well as adults have problems. As a matter of fact, one specialty within psychiatric social work deals exclusively with the problems of children. Right now we are going to show you a film taken at the Child Guidance Center of the Psychiatric Institute of the University of Maryland Hospital. When a mother first applies to the Child Guidance Clinic of University Hospital, she is first interviewed by a psychiatric caseworker. If the problem can be helped by the clinic service, the interview continues, and the child is seen by a psychiatrist. The mother and the caseworker discuss together how the child's unhappiness and confusion are reflected in his actions. The caseworker must have the gift of putting the parent at her ease with an uncritical attitude that invites confidence. She gently removes the barriers of reserve and distrust that exist between two strangers, even though one needs help and the other can give it. The caseworker and the mother consider together the mother's observation that ever since the birth of the boy's baby sister, he has begun to sulk and return to habits he had outgrown. One day, an incident occurred which considerably alarmed the mother. Although this behavior in itself would not indicate any serious maladjustment, the child's choice of games in his session with the psychiatrist indicates that he feels dethroned by his baby sister in the eyes of his parents. Is he getting back at his baby sister by pouring out the contents of the baby bottle? Only a trained observer can judge the significance of the love, hate, guilt, and insecurity which are sometimes acted out in the play of a troubled child. The conversation during an imaginary telephone call has meaning only when interpreted in the light of the other carefully studied data. When necessary, the caseworker communicates frequently by phone with the family doctor or the child's teacher to exchange information in the interest of the child. After the caseworker has talked with the child and worked with the child, he shares his knowledge and his insight into the problems of this child with all the others on the staff, with a team that's working together to help this child. And of course, the people on that team are the psychiatrist and the psychologist, the clinical director, and others. They're all working together as a team to bring about the solution of the problem that this child finds in his own home. Well, now this is the child. What about the juvenile? Well, we'd like to ask Dr. Frank to tell you about another problem, and this problem is the juvenile delinquent, and we're going to call him Hank. Hank is an adolescent who worried us a good bit when we first saw him. He was referred to us by the court for evaluation. He was arrested after he had apparently tried to stab his father with a butcher knife. After we got to know him, we concluded that he was not really a bad boy, but rather an aggressive youngster with limited intelligence who was reacting to too much pressure from his school and home. His father kept insisting that he stay in school, even though he just wasn't smart enough to do his schoolwork. So he began to play hooky, which of course made more trouble for him. He finally reacted to the accumulated strain by throwing the tantrum in which he attacked his father. Our major goal with Hank is to try to take the pressure off him and so give him a better chance to develop his potentialities. This required consultation with the courts and the school system, Hank's family, and with Hank himself to gain a better understanding of his difficulties and assets. Mr. Coakley, one of our psychiatric social work staff, is discussing matters with Hank now. My old man's a guy that doctor should have seen, not me. But that old boy's as touchy as an Avon. You had the put up thing, you would have run him right through with that butcher knife. Not just teased him with it like I did. Well, I guess I gave him something to remember, though. Well, go ahead. That psycho doc old Speck said you were going to make everything real George between me and Pop. How are you going to do it, huh? Well, Hank, I can see that right now you're pretty mad with your dad. Yakking, 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 always yakking about little things. He gives me okay, up. Okay, okay, Hank. What do you mean, yakking about little things? Well, mister, I got two problems. 
And both of them are getting on my nerves. Two problems? Yeah, two problems. One's my old man, the other's school. Now, my old man, he says a guy can't get along unless he's got a good education. Well, that ain't so. He never went to school past the sixth grade, and he's foreman of the train crews where he works. Ah, and at school, I'm fed up with that. Stinking kids, nosy teachers, and that principal. But that old bird, he's got a reserved seat for me in his office. Well, the counselors tell me that you were doing all right in school up to a few months ago. Yeah, I suppose I was doing all right. Yeah, I was getting along fine, like cop picked me up in the park. Why aren't you in school, Sonny? He says to me real sweet like. Danny takes me up to the principal. And that old goat, he made me read I shouldn't play hooky. Five hundred times. I fooled him, though. I got two pencils and wrote double lines. Well, I guess in your opinion, Hank, school is a waste of time. Look, mister. I want to be a grease monkey like my Uncle Pete. But now I got to go to school and learn bone cheer, messieurs, and all that sissy wait, stuff. Wait a minute, Hank. Wait a minute. The doctor did tell you that he and your father and I had a talk about how you felt about school. And you know, don't you, you can go to work if you want to. Yeah, he was just putting on an act for that head doctor. Wait till we get home. Him and Mom will go on yakking about school. I'm not so sure about that, Hank. I was telling your dad about Mrs. Green, the lady down at the Board of Education who helps kids get jobs. He thought it was a pretty good idea. Yeah? Now that sounds well, but what's the gimmick, mister? There is no gimmick, Hank. But maybe you'll have to try it out before you'll believe us. Maybe. I just can't believe my old man let me quit school. Well, your dad says, and I'm pretty well convinced that he means it, that if it's something that you'll stick with, then he's for it. Man, that'd be great. And as far as school is concerned, Hank, there are courses being offered in vocational school in automobile mechanics and body and fender repair work that might help you with your job. You might like them. Now, these are evening courses, and you'd have to go after work. That sounds good. But now, wouldn't it cost money? No, Hank, it's free. For free? Are you kidding? No, I'm not kidding. It is free. But don't forget, you might be working eight hours a day. And going to school evenings might be pretty tough. Oh, heck. You just give me a chance. Say, what about that judge? After that third degree at that psycho doc, I thought for sure he's going to send me up the river. <laughs> Simmer down, Hank. The judge is all for this plan, if you are. Nobody is going to put you away or anything else like that. Now, here's what we will do. You go down tomorrow morning and see... Hank got a work permit under the worker's guidance enrolled in vocational school, and got a job in a garage as part of his training. He responded better than we had dared to hope. Recently, he asked the worker to visit him at the garage. It was obvious that Hank wanted the worker to see for himself how well he was doing. Hi there, Hank. What are you doing? Oh, hi, Mr. Coakley. What do you think of this joint? Imagine me going to school and getting $20 a week while I'm learning. Hey, that sounds great, Hank. Let me show you something. This is a drawing what happens when the gasoline goes through the carburetor. Say, that looks pretty good. It is simple when you see it like this, isn't it? Our teacher's the head mechanic down Central Motors, and he even said it was good. You know, Hank, I wish I knew something about the motor in my own car. Well, you know what Pop said? He said before long we might even be able to do our own motor job on the old Chevy. Say, it sounds as though you're going to be teaching your dad a few tricks. Well, Pop's getting along better now. He ain't so set in that fancy learning no more. Mm, well, you know, my old man, he ain't such a bad guy. Yeah, I know, Hank, I know. Well, we ain't kissing sweet yet, but we ain't yakking and fighting all the time either. Of course, it ain't always my old man that gets me mad. I still get mad when some big shot tries to throw his weight around. But don't worry, I, I don't hit nobody no more. I guess you feel like it sometimes. I sure do. Just that quitting time at the garage the other night, some big shot and a caddy rolls up. Starts demanding this and that. Honest, I felt like busting him right in the mouth. But I didn't. I took a deep breath and I was real polite. And a boss saw that and he come out and he told me to get along to school. Hank, you did a swell job. Holding your temper must have been a pretty tough proposition. Yeah, Mr. Coakley, but I guess I'm really learned all around now, huh? Yes, Hank, I think you are. It's really wonderful what these social service workers do and in their casework. The ca examples you've seen tonight 
we were allowed to go through the files of case after case after case. And when we saw the work that these people do, <clears throat> it was one of the most stimulating, exciting things that it's been our privilege to see as we've done many, many programs of this kind. It's a, it's a fine career, it's an exciting career. It's one that when you finish with something like this, you know you've contributed something to humanity. And maybe it's a good career for you. And if it is, I know that the question you would want me to ask Miss Regina Slaughter right now is, what training should you have to begin this course? How do you start, Miss Slaughter? Well, I suppose we could go back to college and uh, certainly in undergraduate school, it would be helpful if a student took courses in sociology and psychology and cultural anthropology, economics. Uh, there are a lot of undergraduate courses in social work right within the college curriculum today. There are about 50 colleges in the country that have courses like this. 50 colleges that start you on your way toward training for psychiatric casework. While you're still in college, yes. So you first have to get that bachelor's degree, That's but isn't, right. there, isn't there graduate study too? Oh yes, two years of graduate study. And uh, there are about um, 60 university affiliated uh, graduate schools in the country. And I'd like to mention here that there are always scholarships available for uh, students, very promising college students. So I would think that anyone who really wanted to go through a career like this could certainly become a caseworker. And coming to that graduate uh, study, there's, there are these scholarships that will help you. The uh, what are some of the schools that offer this graduate study? Well, the, the uh, graduate schools near here are Catholic University, Howard University, the uh, University of Pittsburgh, the uh, New York School of Social Work, the Pennsylvania School of Social Work, University of North Carolina. And on across the country yes. to, the, to the far, mm -hmm. far west coast. Western Reserve. Well, uh, let me ask you this. When you uh, want a caseworker, let's say at Johns Hopkins here in, in Baltimore, how do you go about getting them? Well, um, we try to... Um, interest people in coming to the Phipps Clinic. Uh, we let the schools, the various schools of social work, know that we are interested in uh, having applicants apply. Then we, there are places to advertise in the various social work magazines. And um, I'm sure that um, this would be the best way if anyone is interested, they should apply in these magazines. For instance, the psychiatric social workers have a little bulletin that they put out called Job Information Service. Mm -hmm. well, now, well, as you say this, Miss Slaughter, uh, it makes me think. You're ri you write to the schools, you advertise, you ask people to come in and talk to you. It's obvious that there must be tremendous opportunity in this. Is oh, that right? Oh, yes, there is. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, though, before we go on to the opportunities, and there are numerous opportunities available for graduate social workers, is that the actual training itself, you mentioned how long it was, and yes. I didn't answer that. Uh, it takes two years of, a of the academic curriculum, and a part of this is spent in practical experience in, a, uh, in an approved psychiatric clinic or social agency, there, the student comes and they work under the guidance and direction of a qualified caseworker. This is a part of the two years it's training. It's on-the-spot training the while you're studying. Practical mm -hmm. training. Mm -hmm. Well, then, uh, well, what are the opportunities? Oh. We, we said you, you have to go out and advertise for them and uh, really beat the bushes. What, what's the opportunity? Well, about every graduate of a school of social work today has approximately 12 positions offered them. You mean when he graduates, there are 12 jobs that he available from which he, he can choose? That's right, that's right. Now, uh, if we want to speak about Maryland, there are about 100 social agencies right now actively seeking staff. And uh, of the positions available, there are probably about 50 or 60 in psychiatric casework in the various hospitals and clinics and uh, uh, psychiatric facilities around Maryland. Uh, one interesting uh, study that I was reading about recently said that in the next 10 years, the country would need approximately 50,000 more 
social workers in addition mm -hmm. to the ones that are already available. In other words, this is not taking into account the replacements that will have to come, but 50,000 additional. Addition to what we have Social right now. welfare workers, yes. Well, then that certainly answers our question of whether there's... <laughs> yes, it does. ...whether there's real opportunity yes, in this. Yes. Well, along with the opportunity, the one thing that we always want to know and have to know, Miss Slaughter, is what sort of salaries can one expect in well, this work? I'm happy to report that's a changing situation. <laughs> Uh, actually, the person who wants to recruit personnel today, the employer who can pay the qualified young graduate mm -hmm. a beginning salary of $4,500 a year, can recruit staff. Mm -hmm. The uh, salaries across the country, uh, the beginning salaries are around $4,000 for a graduate uh, psychiatric caseworker. The range goes from 4,000 to a few positions at 10 and 12,000, but these are, of course, the high administrative jobs in the country in psychiatric mm -hmm. casework. Well, they, these are the salaries that, that, that one can expect. Uh, we all want a good living. We all want to make a good wage. But I'd like Miss Slaughter to really tell us why she is in this work, because there's more to it as you well know, than the salary. Oh, that's very true, Mr. Poole, and I certainly uh, wouldn't want to emphasize the salary because I think caseworkers, or most professional people, really aren't interested just in salary alone. I think the uh, little demonstrations that we've given you tonight would certainly indicate that the work is very interesting, very stimulating, and one enjoys uh, helping troubled people find solutions to their problems. I think this is probably the, the most important answer to the work of the psychiatric case worker. The contributions that these workers can make. People like Miss Slaughter, from coast to coast, from Maine to Florida, every day of the week are working with these people that have problems. In this complex world, well, you know as well as I know, we've got a lot of problems. You can help. Perhaps you'd like to join with them and, and become a psychiatric case worker. There, if you would, find out more about it. There are a lot more things to it. If not, be with us next week where we explore a different career, the career of the architect. Tomorrow's Careers is produced by Lynn Poole. Associate producers Leo Geyer and Edmund Levy. Directors Kennard Kelphy and Herbert P. Cahan. Art direction by Barry Mansfield. Your narrator, Ted Jaffe. Portions of this program have been mechanically reproduced. Tomorrow's careers originates through the facilities of WAAM in Baltimore. Don't miss the Wednesday night fights on ABC Television Network.